Hello and welcome to another Real People Big Astronomy program. I am Renee Kerrigan. I am a member of the Big Astronomy leadership team as well as the planetarium director at the Peoria Riverfront Museum in Peoria, Illinois. Thank you for watching uh, with us today. Big Astronomy is a National Science Foundation funded project that uh, has works to help people understand that it takes more than just telescopes to make big astronomy happen, that it takes diverse teams of people from around the world with all sorts of different skills and backgrounds working at these science facilities to make astronomy and other types of big science work. So uh, uh, there's a lot of components to the big astronomy program. There is a planetarium show that was filmed in both English and Spanish about these observatories and the people who work at them. And we are lucky to be speaking with Marco Bonatti today, who is one of the stars in that planetarium show. Uh, there's also resources for informal educators, uh, a whole toolkit of activities that was created by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. There's a whole website full of information that's called bigastronomy.org and you can find the show that was created by California Academy of Sciences and that kit of activities by AESP at bigastronomy.org. And finally, there are these event series, Real People Big Astronomy, where we talk with the folks who work at these science facilities to try to help people understand a little bit about these STEM careers. And uh, there's educational research being done on this program by Michigan State University. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the program today. So today we are lucky to be speaking with Marco Bonatti, who if you've seen the Big Astronomy film, you saw him as part of the film. He's an electronics detector engineer who works at CTIO and SOARS observatories. He's responsible for uh, those detectors and those science instruments, including the dark energy camera, but all sorts of them. So uh, we are happy to be talking with Marco today. Hi, Marco. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Hey. Uh, so we have a, a slide, some images to share. So let me just get started sharing my screen. And for those of you who are watching, please feel free to let us know where you're watching from in the comments. Uh, say hello where you're watching from and also if you have any questions uh, please put those in the comments here on zoom or um, in the chat window and we'll answer those questions as best we can as we go uh, so we have some questions that we always try to ask our guests on this program and and Marco as uh, has already um, filled out some uh, answers and, and given us some images to go with them. So uh, let's take a look. We'd just like to know a little bit about our guests, um, both about their job and outside of us. So can you just tell us, start off, Marco, by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, okay. Well, I'm uh, by uh, profession, I'm an electronic uh, engineer. I studied engineering in, in uh, Electronic Engineering University, uh, but you know, by by profession, means by experience, I became a detectors engineer. I studied really electrical, electronic, and software engineering. Uh, but detectors is not a profession per se. You just get uh, used to that when you just acquire experience. Um, so, so my job of observatory is mainly uh, development and deploying of new detector systems for specific instruments. And of course, a lot of work goes into maintaining the current systems working. So I am I was involved in the de development of the DECAM uh, detectors and software. Um, and I'm also in charge of maintaining them working properly. Um, so just, just a, I have a, the slide there, just a very simple explanation, just to be very generic of as to what, how this thing about the detectors work. Um, so there's this, you know, more diagram there, which is a telescope, right? With the primary and secondary mirror. So in this case, that will be a cast grain instrument. So an example, you could put the instrument up there in the primary focus to actually they can go up in the primary focus. Um, so inside the instrument, I mean, you'll have all the stuff that um, 
complicated stuff. I mean, you have optics, mechanism, filters, gratings. It could be very simple or could be very complicated depending on the instrument. But in general, at the end of all this light path, you will get to the core, which is the detector, which is basically the transducer. It's a device that takes a photon and outgoes an electron. So it makes a transformation between a photon and an electron. And of course, then you have the electronics that runs this detector, gather those electrons, is one electron per photon in general. So by counting the amount of electrons in each pixel, you know how many photons arrive. And then you have called the software that will get all this information and create the you know, nice images that we're all familiar with. So there is a long process that involves a lot of stuff. Um, and the detector is itself is, is the one that does the magic, of course, and depends on the detector is the wavelength you observe, your know, precision, you know, a lot of, of sort of detector that goes into, into, into the instrument is really related to the science the instrument needs to do. So it's part of the requirement, I would say. Um, so those detectors are, you know, in general, if, if you go to the optical uh, visible uh, wavelengths are pretty much like any detector in your cell phone camera. Uh, the cell phone cameras are CMOS mode, mostly. We use CMOS in science, but mostly CCDs really, because they're much quieter. Um, so they are pretty similar, also, I mean, except that the, the size is much bigger and, and so is the, the price, of course. Uh, but of course, you can also have detectors that uh, will observe in different wavelengths. So at the observatory, we, we have mostly um, a visible, but we also have a near infrared, so up to 2.5 microns or something like that. So, so my job is basically um, take care of this, you know, whole chain really. I detector electronics and a lot of the software. Uh, I do mostly the data acquisition software for them too, which includes, you know, drivers and stuff like that. That's really interesting to me that your job includes all those different uh, aspects of taking care of the detectors, both, you know, the software and the hardware aspects of it. I'm, I'm curious what you like working with well, I mean, the, the, the truth is that I, I'm officially, I'm a software. So I should be taking care of just the driver and the data acquisition. But since I, electronic engineer, I've been working with detectors. In truth, I, I also take care of the detectors. So it's, it's been accumulating over the years. You start adding more stuff. And yeah, I mean, I like both. Actually. I, I like all the chain. Uh, I like the working with the detector themselves. It's, it's very interesting when you're deploying a new system because you need to understand the detectors. And sometimes they are very novel detectors. Not even the manufacturer knows them very well. So it's it's, it's very interesting because you're really going sometimes to very new ter territory. Um, you need to you have a special problem you're trying to solve, right? What you're trying to observe yes. and you have to create the, the solution to your, to exactly, your problem. Exactly. Uh, sometimes you need to, you know, in, invent, make up some test, you know, to devise some characteristics. So it's, it's very interesting. And of course the, the electronics goes together because, you know, you have very special electronics, very quiet, very, um, so it's, it's, it's interesting actually the whole chain. I, I like all of it <laughs> really. Okay, so well, that's you've you've told us about what you do and and what the detectors are that you specialize in, but um, that leads really nicely to this question of um, your path of where you are today because you you have a quite specialized field, yeah. uh, and I'm sure it took a little of some steps to get to that path. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Um, okay, so. But as I mentioned, I, I studied electronic engineering um, in university. Um, when I was in university, I really, I liked the, uh, astronomy really. I was part of this astronomy group and stuff like that. But to be honest, it wasn't really my only passion or anything. It's like, like I, I wanted to go into astronomy I mean, forever. Not, not at all, really. I liked it, but you know, it's, it was a life path for most people, I guess. So I, I did um, 
um, I, I think something that in a way defined this is that when I was studying um, electronics engineering, uh, I did a summer practice job at CTIO um, and I really loved it. I mean, I loved the place. I loved, uh, you know, the work. I love the people. So I think that that certainly uh, made uh, made uh, what was an important um, aspect. I, I learned that later, of course. But basically, when I finished, I went to you know mining company for I specialize in telecommunications, you know, radio communication stuff like that, fiber optics. Not very related to what I'm doing now. But I started working on that in mining company, then in some publishing company. But at some point, uh, I had a friend, a close friend who worked at CTIO. Uh, he was electronic engineer too. Uh, he was leaving for ESO to Germany. So he was leaving the position. Uh, so he, he told me, you know, there is this position I should apply. And I did apply. And, and I did apply because I liked the experience of CTIO. And I loved, I, I really loved, I loved La Serena, which is the, the city where, where the observatory is. So I, I applied and then, you know, I was, I got the job uh, without knowing much about it, really. Um, so, and then we moved from, we were living in Santiago at the time. So we moved to, to La Serena with my wife, Pamela, and I had a daughter by the time, which is Catalina. She was very small when we moved there. Um, then the position in which I went was actually an electronic engineering position. and. It was exactly related to designing uh, electronics board uh, for uh, the controllers that handle the detectors, CCDs in particular. That was a big project at the time at CTIO. Uh, there was an in-house controller called Arcon that was spread, even spread to other observatories too. So it was a big, important controller at the time. So I moved into, I went into the electronics for this device. So this is what I first got into contact with, you know, the detector, really scientific detector. Uh, but it was a, was a, uh, wasn't a permanent position, it was a three years position only for a particular project. But while I was in it, there was an opening in software uh, that was, you know, uh, permanent. So they told me, you know, if you want to stay, the easiest way would be to just, you know, just move to the software side. And, and yeah, so I did. So I, I, was, I was then hired permanently at CTIO in the software group. In practice, uh, I kept doing what I was doing pretty much, only that I shifted a bit, and that was a shift to software. I shifted, you know, because one thing is working at low level with the electronics itself and the detector, but then now I needed to go a bit up the change and take a look at the software side, you know, how you get the data, how you, you know, interact with the controller. So that's why I came to do both things. And, and of course, when you do both things, you already are in touch with the detector. So you start understanding how the detectors work too. There's not many people who do that. So you start, you know, specializing. So after a few years at CTIO, I, I applied to a job position at Caltech and, and I got it in the astronomy department. So we moved to California and what I did that was, you know, pretty much the same. Detectors, uh, instrumentation in general. Uh, so I, there I brought that a bit because, you know, I started learning more about the mechanics, the cryogenics, and more more like instrumentation itself, but also focus on detectors. So there I worked mainly for uh, Palomar instrumentation, also development instrumentation, maintain instrumentation, and and well, Caltech is partly KEC, so I did work in KEC sometimes, and, and operate JPL, so I got to work in a couple of projects with JPL. Um, and then I, we had our second daughter, Bianca, in there. And then after a few years, um, I don't know, six years or something like that, um, there was an opening at CTIO and they, you know, they, they asked me if I was willing to come back. I think the main reason for that was actually Deccan because Deccan was coming and they wanted someone else. So I had this position and then we say, okay, let's go back. Why not? So we did. So, and then 
came, came back. And that's why I was mostly uh, involved in the DECAM development in the software. So of course, while developing uh, DECAM or helping to, to, to do DECAM, you know, DECAM was that by Fermilab. So I got in contact with a lot of people from uh, particle physics at Fermilab. Uh, and we got along. So after DECAM was done, DECAM started the commission was in 2012. So a few years later, you know, I kept going to Fermilab, uh, helping them in one way or another, different small stuff. And in 2016, I got uh, an agreement with CTIU and I went to Fermilab for a year and a half, with family and all to help them with some particular uh, projects, which actually were the uh, characterization of the detectors for uh, DESI is the big spectrography Maya that LVNL deployed there, but Fermilab did take care of the detector. So we stayed over there. When that was done, we came back to CTIU and here I am. So as you see, I, I mean, from the moment I started at CTIU, I came you know, uh, down of detectors part. And, and the thing is that when, once you are in, you get sort of flocked in because there is not you know, many people who do, do this. Yes, it, it sounds like you have. Um, you, I, I would hazard a guess, Marco, that you are the top in the in the field of uh, <laughs> no, detectors, <laughs> or at no, least no, uh, you must be up there to have uh, worked at all these different institutions and to have worked at at Fermilab and Caltech and, and CTIO, where all these, these fantastic uh, discoveries are are being made. And um, when you were telling that story, I just thought. Um, what an interesting path and, and being willing to move and sort of reinvent yourself every time a little bit, you know, when you have to move yeah. from one place to another. Um, do, Fermilab is not far from where I live. Uh, so I, it's, it's very interesting. And with Fermilab, you probably were not detecting light, um, yeah. your particles you were working on. Yeah, well, well, the 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 thing that I was doing there, the the the, the project in, for which I I was um, I was allowed to stay there uh, was actually uh, these detectors for this, which are actually light detectors. Okay. Uh, so that was my main thing. But of course, while being there, I I helped them to another sort of detectors, actually CCDs, but for dark matter mostly. Uh, so exactly no light, just particles. Very, uh, very interesting. Just particles. So that, that, that's why I learned, you know, a lot new usages and new aspects of these devices. I also got to work with some very, very different detectors that in a way we are trying to bring to astronomy because they could be used in astronomy too. So, yeah. Well, uh... What would you say has been the biggest challenge in your career so far, and how are you able to handle it? Yeah, well, I, I think that it's I mean, changing, uh, changing, uh, not particularly career, but life. I mean, goes together. You know, changing, changing countries is always different. It's also always hard because, you know, it's it's very nice to travel along and all and all that, but you know, going to live in a different country is, is not easy. From many, 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 many points of view. Uh, so that was what well, that was a hard decision the first time, particularly, of course, uh, moving with family over there. And so that was hard. Um, also, of course, you go into a different environment. You know, Caltech has a big, big name, so you get a bit scared sometimes at the beginning, you know. Um, so it's, I think that is, 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 is taking up the, 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 the changes. Uh, so, of course, because, you know, if you are okay in a place, uh, you may ask, well, you know, stay, say, and what for? I'm, I'm doing fine here, my job is good, my life is good, what, what change? I mean, and th there is no right answer, I think, you know, depends on the person, but uh, we, we, as a family, I mean, decide to just take the risk and, you know, change the course if required, if required and it's possible, better go do the change. I mean, you get a rich life. It's risky, of course, but you, know, you get to go to a good much life. Risk and, um, and much reward, right? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and of course, from the point of view of a professional point of view in, in, in most areas, that is true, but in the detectors area is, I would say particularly true that um, evolves very quickly, very quickly. So unless you try to keep up, you will get, you know, um, obsolete very, very soon. Uh, and so it's, it's a challenge to stay up trying to, you cannot stay on top really. It changes too fast, it's too broad an area. Um, you cannot stay on top of everything, but you can at least try to keep understanding this new device and see how you can you know, refit, reapply. So that, that is a, it's a challenge. And I see you say and, separating and, work life from family yes, life. Of course, that, that happened for, for, for many people, but it's, it's totally true for, for me too, that, you know, you have so much work and also the fact that you like what you are doing, uh, you, have, you have a lot of work and you like what you're doing, it's so easy to just, uh, you know, move the limits and keep working and that causes problems. So you, at the end, you need to learn to, you know, separate one from the other. And, but I'm, I'm sure that happened to a lot of people anyway. I think it's almost a universal problem, it, it seems yeah. like, but we're all fighting that challenge. Uh, so what would you say your favorite thing about your job is and, and what do you like about it? Um, well, I like a lot of things from this area, really. Um, but I think that what I like in general is instrumentation. Uh, I, I like it because it's, uh, it's really multi-field area, cross fields. I mean, you have so many things, um, electronics, software, physics, optics, you know, uh, you, you need to, to get to work with a lot. I mean, the, these instruments in general, take DECAM as the, the, the example I have there because you know, it's a complex instrument. And so you get to work with, uh, with a lot of people uh, from very different fields all very, very smart people. So you get to learn, you always keep learning. And that's that's a very good thing. So you get to work with these amazingly smart people in, in fields which are very related, uh, but all required. You need to work with them, you need to learn. So so see, as a sample there, you, you, you have, you know, to get to the final image you see there, there is so much work. I mean, they can cost like 10 years of development with, you know, I don't know how many tens of engineers and technicians, you know, it's a huge work. Um, and, and as I said, involve, you know, a lot of optics, a lot of vacuum and cryogenic because these devices need to be run normally at minus 100 C or something like that. Um, so you need to have a vacuum there to isolate them. You need to design ways to keep them cool. You need to design waves of ways of, uh, keeping the temperature stable of these devices. So around the device, you need to, to have a lot of, you know, um, control loops, uh, feedback loops. Uh, so it, you end up with this very complex system. Uh, and mechanically it's very complex too. I put there the picture of the inside of the back of the cam. And each one of those uh, other things is a flex circuit for one of the device. So you have, 70 of those in there. So even mechanically, it's a challenge to do that, you know, install them, you know, uh, without damaging them. They are very sensitive devices. So, and of course that's going to this vacuum environment, everything is specially designed for the cool down. So it's, it's very complex and it's very interesting really, because every time a new instrument comes, you need to, you know that you are gonna learn every time. I mean. I mean, every time there is a new instrument, even if it's a simple one, every time you learn, every time. I mean, it's, and, and I really like that. The fact that you know that every, every, every time is gonna be you know, a, a bit of a different challenge. Uh, I like that. Uh, and the other thing that I like is more, you know, maybe abstract thing is that I, I really love the fact that all this is done, just um, pure knowledge. I mean, there is no monetary gain in this case. And even there is no even a practical application. You know, in, in other science, you go for the practical part, you know, uh, you know, how you get improve the energy the efficiency or how you get, you know, but this, this is really pure 
knowledge. I mean, no one is gonna make anything out of this other than knowing what the universe is. Uh, sure, there is some 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 ways, you know, for development, technology development, you know, you get, you know, to to use these things in another areas. But the main goal of this is just um, is just um, pure science, pure knowledge, and I find it great that that really so many smart people is willing to mess their lives basically just for the sake of knowledge and i really love that i think it's uh, it's good so i again i i really love the idea of uh, being part of this because you know you are a small call i mean there is a lot of people doing this but you know you do your part and then you know that you know every tiny contribution to advance this knowledge. And that is rewarding in itself. It's a uh, pure knowledge that you're contributing to and also exploration, you know, you're doing yeah, exactly. exploration in without sense. ever leaving the ground and which is pretty wonderful as well. Yeah. Okay, so we, we asked, the, you know, your favorite part of your job and then yeah. we always have to ask the other side of the coin, what is your yeah. least favorite part of your job? Well, in, in general, I, I like it. Yeah, least favorite is a good word, as I said, because it's not that I don't like it, but it's, I prefer, you know, in general, I, I like development. I like doing new things, trying new things, you know, develop new instrument or help with new detectors. Like, I really uh, like that part, the development. Now, of course, the important thing is once you have deployed an instrument, then a commissioning and it's producing science, obviously it takes the full um, priority. So once the, the instrument is producing science, it has the biggest priority. So if there is any issue or problem, uh, you need to leave everything and just go and fix it. And that sometimes is interesting, actually interesting, uh, trying to fix the, the problem. But in general, something that you, it's interesting you already know. Um, and also there is a lot of pressure because, you know, uh, you know, if you, you don't want to be losing nights. So it's, 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 a, it's a, I mean, Maintenance is something that I don't like that much. I mean, I like it actually, but I prefer development. Now, of course, the advantage here is that, you know, there is wonderful crew in the mountains. Uh, they are really good people and they take care of, you know, I put 95% there, but it's maybe more of all the issues. It's only just a tiny percent that get leaked to you. Uh, so I, I cannot, I cannot really complain. And, and these people is so good, and so smart too. I mean, you get amazed on how they solve the problem because they need to act quickly. Uh, so they, they develop this, this cleverness that it's, it's really amazing. I, I really love uh, working with them too. Um, but of course, they, they, they also it means that, you know, keeping these things alive means that in general, you should be, I mean, you try to be available every time if there is a problem, and normally the problems are at night. So <laughs> that's fine. That's the that's so joke. No one really likes being woken up in in the night for a yeah. To fix the problem. But, yeah, but uh, yeah, but it's not that I don't like it. That's it. It's, it's really nice. So we like to ask um, a little bit about folks, uh, not just about their jobs, but a little bit just about themselves. So one thing we always ask is, what is your favorite astronomical yeah. object? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't come up with a particular object. I, I put here a number of things. Um, I, I, I mean, just for the sheer power of them, I always be, you know, uh, fascinated with quasars. I mean, the amount of energy that is produced there, um, probably because of the black hole in the center, but they're much more spectacular because they are, they have the power of billions of suns. Uh, of, gal of, of whole galaxies, really. Uh, so they're like big, you know, these big ancient things that consume everything around. I mean, it's the most powerful thing I can think of, really. It's, it's amazing. Uh, in pulsars, I like too, it's similar. Uh, it's similar in the sense that they also meet, you know, radiation, but these pulsars are much smaller, of course, uh, but they are pretty cool object with the precision of, you know, an atomic clock. And it's always been, you know, interesting stuff to me. I mean, even the first time they were, they were, uh, they were seen, they they were assumed to be, you know, extraterrestrial 
terrestrial life, LG, LGM, I, Little Green Man, LGM, I think was the name that they was given the first time. And so it, they are like beacons too in, in, in the space. It's like a lighthouse uh, that could be used probably for uh, navigation. In fact, I think that in way they did the golden record in the Voyager, they put the, um, the reference of the start of the Earth position was in reference to some pulsars. That's right. There's a whole map on the on the Voyager yeah. records and the Pioneer records uh, showing yeah. where we are with the with the pulsars. Yes, exactly. So the 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 next image there with the two small arrows is is really is not an it's not a particular uh, object in the sky. Uh, well, it is, but but the reason that I put there is just that um, I've I felt, you know, um, it, it was very, I felt that it was a very strong event. This was in, in 2017, I think, October, uh, when LIGO detected this um, gravitational wave from the collision of two uh, binary neutron stars. And, and what happened is that some instrument, wi instrument, and DECAM in particular, uh, were directed to the place where this should be happening. And they were able to find, they were able to actually image the future. So you can see up there the two objects and the second down there is no, it's none. So they confirm visually the gravitational way, which I see for me was shocking. I mean, it was incredible. It was really, really, um, that's done for the first time, this confirmation of gravitational waves. And I found it amazing. It really I find it amazing. And, and, and again, that, that was a big reward because it was, you know, that image was DECAM. So, you know, you, the, little, the little tiny contribution helped to see this amazing, amazing thing. Um, yeah, so that's what I put it there. Um, now, you know the other things are really uh, more on the uh, my humanistic or um, anthropological side. I would say <laughs> constellation are not really object in the sky. Obviously, they are just object in our minds. Um, but I find it fascinating because every time you look up there and you try to see what is the shape, you are actually looking at the same thing that people thousands of years ago looked at, and they made stories about them. And you feel connected to these people because, you know, I like mythology. And then, of course, you know, these objects are connected to their mythology and not just Greeks. You know, a lot of people did this. And so you feel like part of, you feel a connection, a particular connection with the human race. Um, so that's why I really I like them. And, and, you know, the next, the next image is similar. I'm sure that most people is familiar with that image up there. Not many with the one in the down there, which was done by Cassini. Uh, but you know, the of course, we are not an object in the sky if we are here. But if you are in the Voyager, you are an object in the sky. So, so that's what I put there anyway, uh, because you know that first image up there, the first time I saw it, uh, it was it was. I mean, I felt uh, breathless. It's it's amazing and. And, and the description that Sagan did, uh, we did, was exactly along the lines that I was, what I was feeling. I mean, it's just uh, an amazing, amazing image. Um, that's what I, I put there because it's, it's always in my mind. And those uh, two images are, are both of Earth, uh, the farthest away with the, the pale blue dot image. And then of course, Earth and the moon there from Cassini at, at yeah. uh, Saturn. And, I agree. The first time I, I saw them, both of them, I had that same feeling of, of breathlessness, of knowing that that's us, every single one of us right there. Yeah, little... exactly. I mean, it, it, you can you can start all sorts of, you know, discussions about that, what you feel when doing that. You could you could feel, you know, nihilist with that, but it's, it's, it's really, it's really amazing image. I really love that image. So you've told us a, a little bit about your job and, and the different aspects of your job, but um, what does a day at work look like 
for you? What's a typical day if there is a typical day for you at work? Well, I, I guess there are typical days. Well, these days, of course, are more typical, you know, since, you know, working from home is pretty typical normally. But uh, I put there more like, uh, you know, in general, uh, not necessarily these days. But uh, yeah, I mean, the usual thing is I think that as most people do, you just need to go and read your emails because uh, in the emails in particular, you get night reports. Uh, so every instrument that's been used the day before, they have a you know report saying how it behaves. If there is any issue with it, you you will find it there. So if there are issues, um, you need to go you know try to fix them during the day. So that is the first thing you normally do. Just be sure that everything is working as it should. And then you know I mean if there is a problem you will mow along and you know try to solve that solve, solve that problem. Uh, of course, part of that too is you know reviewing telemetry. We have we will be able to instrument most of the uh, of the important things on the instrument. I mean, I mean, uh, um, temperatures, you know, pressures, or stuff like that that you normally have in there. And and you take a look, be sure that everything is fine. We have also automatic scripts that will uh, report how the quality of the data of the detectors is if it's too noisy or gain has changed. So you check that everything is stable before you move on. And if you move on, well, I normally will uh, either start you know, coding stuff that you need uh, to do, or uh, I will go down to the lab if I need to you know, keep doing detector test or optical test or, or whatever. And, and of course the uh, meetings, Meetings these days, more meetings, of course, but meetings are always, you know, something that is 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 required. Um, some people may say, unfortunately, but yeah. And and of course, many times uh, I need to go to the observatory either for you know fixing a problem, and many times just to add more stuff on you know um, more routine work. But you need to do it up there. I, I really love going to the mountain. It's very nice. The whole thing. The trip, you know, the, the car, the people up there. It's, it's, it's a very nice experience. Normally by the day though, I mean, normally you don't stay up there at night unless there is a problem or unless there is a, a commissioning for, for some instrument. I mean, sometimes you need to stay a week, uh, but in general, it's just uh, day work. Which is a treat. I was sharing before we started that I am lucky to have visited uh, CTIO uh, campus and it's a treat to visit yeah. when, when times return uh, to normal and you can visit again. I encourage all of our viewers if they have an opportunity yeah. To, yeah. To, to go. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really nice. It's really amazing because the, the night sky, especially when it's uh, completely clear, is just amazing. It's really amazing. I mean, it's like moonlight without moon. Even it is just it's just uh, magnificent. So yeah, just walk out of the dome and look up at the sky. It's just uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so why typical day at home? Well, you know, I guess this day. I mean, I'm not. Go I'm going to consider a day at home as a free day because this day we're all at home anyway, right? So I could repeat the previous slide mostly, but but um, uh, assuming that I. I you know, the weekend or you know, holiday or whatever. I, I mostly when I like to read. I always like it to read, so I read a lot. A lot of my free time is reading. Um, uh, we also live very close to a small uh, mountain place, so we go there and and walk, particularly with the with the dog that is there. It's our little dog. I play with it, with her and also walk with her, and then. What else? I mean, uh, my uh, younger daughter likes to cook a lot, so I helped help her. I uh, I like to cook too. There's all the chores you need to do in the garden, you know, painting, you know, repairing things. That I also enjoy. I also enjoy when it to be done. Uh, we like to watch movies in family. Uh, a lot of movies actually. Um, and well, the, 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 the people there standing on the side of the care, that is that my uh, older daughter, she has a postgrade in English literature. Since I like to read a lot, I was, you know, always keep, you know, discussing about books and stuff. I always lost, I lose, of course, because she's the scholar. I'm just an amateur, but it's always nice to talk and, and learn from, from her. It's, it's very nice. 
and and of course the uh, if if as I mentioned before, normally if there is a problem with an issue, well, you need to go get your emails and start working on. If it's too too much of a problem, you need to just take the card and go up, uh, even if it's a holiday. I mean, it's important. So we also like to know a little bit about you, uh, you know, yeah. we, the reason we actually ask these questions of, um, you know, what do you like to do at home and what do you like to do, what does work like is because the goal is to help people understand that, you know, the people who work in science are whole people, just like the people who work in, yeah. in any other job. So anyway. that's why we also ask uh, about your favorite subject in school. What did you like to yeah. study when you sure. were in school? Sure. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard for me to tell. I couldn't pick one. I, I had I had a, the problem I had is that I loved everything. I really loved everything from many different fields. So I loved physics and biology, but but not just I. I, I love philosophy and language, literature, history, maths. I pretty much liked everything. Uh, uh, as I put there, I mean, I was undecided between you know engineering or marine biology or anthropology. You know, it's completely different field so i was fairly lost with what i i wanted uh because i liked it, everything really uh so it was hard to decide and honestly i'm not sure why i did go with engineering uh i think i could as well uh have gone with anthropology but at the time i decided engineering and here i am <laughs> It's good to so, have that knowledge. I'm sure that knowing a little bit about all those other subjects informs the work that you do uh, today. Uh, so we also, since we ask about your favorite subject, we like yeah. to ask about the least favorite subject that well, you had. I, I, I would say not that I didn't like, but it, 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 it it's not that I didn't like, not like art. It was a pain for me I, I, because I, I'm not really very talented in painting and drawing and stuff. and and. So it was always, you know, a pain knowing that I needed to complete something. You know, I was usually Sundays at night, uh, yeah, trying to complete the thing and and doing a mess. It was, it was by far the most painful thing. Not that I, I don't like that. Actually, I do like a lot painting and, and drawing. So I, I really love that things, but I cannot do them. I mean, I just want want to watch them and not do it. Uh, it was very hard and and also Jim it's it wasn't my thing uh I never been guy of uh, you know sports team guy I like it to swim I did you know scuba diving and you know and other stuff but usually um things that and trekking of course uh things that require you yourself uh in general so yeah those two subjects were in my uh the strongest. <laughs> I have uh, I have sympathy with you on art because I love art. I love to learn about art. I love to teach about art. But one time I had a class that I had to try to attempt to to draw, you know, make art in yeah. that way. Oh, it was painful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, for the, 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 actually, my my in university, my um, my worst. I mean, probably the oldest subject, the hardest for me was the 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 uh, drawing because we did you know technical drawing and and we we were the last uh, generation that actually did use the paper and a uh, you know and a pen yeah. uh, the next one uh, of course started using autocad but yeah. uh, for so to, so i remember that that was in old university probably the one that i most suffered <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, you, I think you'll probably tell me some of the same things you told me about uh, your typical day at home, but we ask, like to ask to close out you know, what you like to do for fun. Actually, I, when I was composing this uh, slide, I realized that a lot of this is actually what I do at home. So I think that's lucky. Uh, so yeah, I mean, pretty much that. I mean, I as I mentioned before, I, I read, I read a lot. And we, you know, do small trek in the mountain. We are lucky to live like uh, easy, you know, five minutes easy walking to the beach, which is that beach in, the, in, in there. So, you know, walking to the beach, particularly in winter where there are not crowds of people is, is beautiful. I, I really love that. Uh, no one, I mean, when the, the beach looks like that, it's, it's really, it's really nice. And also cook and also see movies. And so 
yeah, so it's pretty much the same things I do in a in a normal holiday. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Marco, for telling us a little bit about your your job and about your life. I found it uh, very interesting, and I know our um, our our viewers did as well. So. For all everyone watching, um, if you have any questions for Marco about his job or, or about anything we've talked about today, about the detectors or, uh, you know, uh, any of the aspects of the job that we've talked about today, please feel free to leave them in the chat. You can leave them in the chat on Zoom. You can also put it in the chat on uh, Facebook. And Marco, um, we did have uh, perhaps somebody you know, Sergio, uh, who said, good afternoon, Marco, many greetings, and glad to see you on this. So we've had uh, some viewers, we had a, a classroom watching today, uh, learning about your job uh, as well. And uh, while we're seeing if any questions come up from our um, attendees, I would like to introduce Dr. Jessica Truck who will talk a little bit about the research that's being done uh, on this project and how you might be able to help. Hi everyone, so this is an NSF funded project. Um, and as part of that, the research team is conducting educational research around the Big Astronomy Project. So if you would like to help us out with that, we would really love it if you could. You can help us out by filling out the survey that will be showing up in the comments section shortly. If you fill out the survey, you'll be entered to win a $10 gift card from Amazon. Another way you can help is during the survey, you can opt in to talk with us two times over the next few months and afterwards receive a $40 gift card to Amazon. So if you'd like to help, we'd really appreciate it and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, I don't see any questions from our viewers right now, but I did have one, Marco, which is, um, you know, you've worked on all these different instruments uh, over the years, and I'm curious if you are working on a new project or if you think there's um, something new on the horizon that you're looking forward to. Um, yeah, 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 sure, of course. I mean, um, right now we have uh, we have one, one project, which is the biggest, which is the it really uh, comes to bring uh, up to date in, the, in all the instrument that was used at Kit Peak, an infrared, big infrared, infrared imager that we're bringing down to CTIO. But that requires a lot of work because you know it's a very old system, so we need to redo a lot of the stuff. So that that's actually very interesting because it's a bit like making it anew. Um, that's one, and and there is in the cooks another project for uh, bringing an, another old instrument to soar, also a bit farther away. We are, you know, there are some uh, possibilities of building a new uh, instrument for soar, which is the full coverage um, instrument, and also it's, I mean, we are, you know, we are now uh, this new big organization called Noir Lab, mm -hmm. right, which is the, uh, encompasses a lot of uh, telescope, not just CTIO and SOA, but Gemini North and South and, and, and Kid Peak. So the new reorganization, we are of course uh, with the uh, idea or trying to, or with the hope that will also serve as a hub for developing instrumentation for the community. So I hope that um, a lot of interesting projects may arise from there too. Well, of course, there is another one, which is, I would say in the cooks that probably will be done, but not much thought yet, which is the post decam because decam right. uh, ended the DS survey and it's going to be another five years or more. But then uh, we need to think what we do after that. We could do yeah, what you do with that fantastic zero, wide field. Of view, right? Exactly. Or retrofit it with something else or just do something, uh, some other big instrument there too. So, yeah, there, there are plenty of things coming. We have some collaboration with people that Fermi Lab 2, trying to get uh, new detectors. You know, have never been tested in the sky. That, so that's another small project we have right now. So yeah, it's always interesting things. George, who's uh, watching with us here on Zoom, asked, and we'll have this uh, be the last question because they were closing in the hour, but um, what temperatures do the detectors uh, typically operate at? 
that depends a lot on the detector. Most of the visible detectors uh, operate at they say around minus 100 C, between minus 100 and minus 130 C usually. Um, that's like 160 Kelvin, something like that. Uh, that's the temperature for Deccan is minus 100. Uh, but if you go if you go a bit upper in wavelength, so you go to the infrared, you start uh, requiring lower temperatures. Basically, that that's that's because the, I mean the reason the these devices are cold uh, is that they are so sensitive that if you have them warm, the thermal energy is such that will fill your detector with just uh, electrons coming from the thermal energy of the device itself. So you won't see anything. Right. So as you cool down, you take out the thermal energy, so leaving it sensitive to just the one of the photons. And of course, depending on the, uh, the what, what is the range that you want to detect, you need to cool them even more. Because if you go up to the infrared, the band gap, which is called, is, is has requires less energy. So it's easier for the thermal electrons to jump and, you know, obscure your detector. So, you, so the farther you go into infrared, the lower you need to cool down. So for uh, infrared devices, we usually uh, go with uh, uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, which is 77 Kelvin or minus 196 Celsius. I remember seeing the big, big uh, doer of liquid nitrogen at CTIO being very impressed by uh, pumping that yeah. nitrogen. In. Yeah, yeah, we, we have that, I mean, that is kept filled because it's used for many, many instruments to cool them down. I mean, we have a lot of uh, liquid nitrogen in our doers and, and another, including late decam is also liquid nitrogen, but it's a closed circuit. It's very complex circuit, it's liquid nitrogen. So well, yeah, we use a lot of that. I uh, just wanted to say thank you, Marco. It's been really fun to learn about your job uh, and about all the different things that go into doing uh, what you do. Uh, and I'm fascinated hearing about your your career path from, from place to place. Uh, George says thank you uh, for sharing your presentation with us. And um, Bianc watching on uh, Facebook is saying thank you as well. So lots of lots of happy guests. So for everyone watching, um, I just want to mention that our next program is uh, another Real People Big Astronomy program, and this is featuring Eduardo Toro, um, and it will be on April 29th in the evening at 7 p.m. Uh, Chile time and Eastern Daylight time. Um, so we'll be learning about his job and his life. He's an uh, information technology engineer at NOAA Lab as well. So thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope to see you in a couple of weeks at the next program. Don't forget to fill out that survey if you'd like to help with our research. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you, Marco. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.